Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, and I have a really cool uh, once-in-a-lifetime chance here to take a look at the only extant Pancor jackhammer. So, first off, I really want to throw out a thank you to Chad, who is the owner of this gun, who uh, was okay with me fondling it and getting it on video for you guys. These guns are really well known primarily for video games, and secondarily through some movies both uh, movies with the jackhammer itself and actually movies that have guns that are made to look like jackhammers as well. Ironically, the only three of these were ever made in the first place and they never found any sort of production or, accept or military acceptance, but they've come to be culturally fairly well known through video games. So a uh, little bit of the background on this thing. Uh, John Anderson was the guy who originally designed this. He, he ran a little one or two man shop um, out in the Mountain West, and his experience with shotguns started in the Korean War, where he actually used pump shotguns in combat. And while he was doing so, apparently really thought he could do better. Um, loading the thing was time consuming and a bit awkward, and so he started back in the 50s in the Korean War, started thinking about ways you could do a better combat shotgun. Well, he came back to the States, started tinkering, um, took out some patents, and, and ended up building this the, the Pancor Jackhammer Full Auto Combat Shotgun. He did submit it to military trials, and that's kind of where the whole project fell apart on him. Um, this did reasonably well in trials. Uh, HP White did a, a full formal destructive test on it. It was able to go through 50,000 rounds without significant problem. The, the problem was uh, Anderson had a little small company. He didn't have a whole ton of funding and the Department of Defense was, they were deciding whether they wanted the shotgun uh, for U.S. military use, and while they were thinking about that, they wouldn't let him export it to anybody. So they take their time, eventually they decide not to adopt it, and by that point, Pancor has pretty much run out of money and gone broke and doesn't have any capital left to build more models to sell. He got a lot of foreign interest in the gun from everywhere on the planet, basically, but nobody who was interested enough to finance development and final production of it. So the gun kind of fizzled out at that point, much to his disappointment. Uh, ultimately, like I said, three of these were built, two of them were destroyed by H.P. White, so this is the only surviving example. Uh, Ant Anderson did build a bunch of other examples out of basically sheet tin and balsa wood and clay, he was making a lot of working examples, working uh, tool prototypes that way. Figure out exactly how to dimension things, what would work. Um, so he made a couple dozen of those apparently, but only the only surviving one is this, the only surviving functional one is this one. It's also interesting to note that this gun, people look at this and because you've seen it in so many video games, we tend to assume that this is the military gun and it, this is how it would have looked. In actual fact, this gun is basically a tool room prototype. It's a proof of concept. It is, it's not quite shaped the way that the final production guns would have been. It has a lot more material on it. There are a lot of big cast parts, especially things like the trigger guard down here, or the, the trigger assembly, grip assembly. On the guns that were sent to HP White, there was like four pounds of material removed. They used a lot of stampings and a lot of lighter parts. This was the very first one. Um, when we start disassembling it, you'll see that there are some kind of complicated areas where you take a look and go, wow, that the military would never accept that. Well, that's because the designer improved those areas and he came up with better mechanisms. And this was simply the first gun and this is the one that he kept for himself uh, when he sent others off to be tested. So, with that in mind, some of the basic controls here, it's actually a very simple gun to use, and unlike a lot of, a lot of guns that look really cool on the outside turn out to be kind of blasé on the inside, this one is actually a very creative and interesting mechanism, which will be just really cool to look at. Anyway, we have three main controls that you can see here. Safety on the side, I'll start with. This is safe, semi-auto, full auto. We'll take a look at exactly how that works when we pull it apart, pretty simple. This hook back here is actually a cocking lever. So if you have a light strike on a cartridge, you can recock the action, the striker, with that to try firing it again. Um, so this is not a control you would typically use. What you mainly use is this handguard, which actually cycles forward. That uh, manually rotates the action, 
and recocks the striker. So that's your charging handle. One funny thing that I really want to point out, it, this ribbed forearm is kind of distinctive on these guns. You'll see that virtually every time you see a depiction of the gun. It wasn't actually originally on the gun. Um, the first guy, basically, the first guy who bought this from Anderson when he decided to sell off his assets or his, his interest in the gun, the first guy who bought it was a, a movie gun company. And when he got the gun, this forearm was, was really slick. It's smooth metal, painted. And he said, unless you had just like totally dry hands, your hand would slip on this thing and it'd be really hard to use. So he took the rubber handguard from an MP5 SD and screwed it onto the, the handguard here. And that's why it looks this way. So also a lot of our depictions in video games of the gun come from that original owner. Uh, he rented it out to a couple movie companies. He also uh, basically rented out use of it to animators and computer graphics guys for comic books and for video games. And so they would come in and 3D model the thing. And that's where most of it, most of the depictions come from. All right, before I get deep into disassembly, let me show you just the basic operating mechanism that you can see from the outside. Because there's only a little bit going on uh, visually. The main thing we have here is our drum magazine. This holds 10 rounds. Uh, 12 gauge, uh, standard size 12 gauge. Now the military trials for guns like this, what the military was looking for was actually a very wide variety of ammunition. They wanted buckshot, they wanted flashes, they wanted mini grenades, they wanted all sorts of stuff. And some of the big companies that designed guns like this, like the HK Cause, um, were able to partner with ammunition companies and supply that sort of thing. Anderson was basically just a little home shop doing this on his own. So he had no way to make specialty ammunition. Instead, he designed this gun around military number four buckshot, which is the, the buckshot that they had initially specified. So the way this works is actually reminiscent of a Webley Fosbury automatic revolver. When the gun cycles, there's a pin that controls rotation of the drum magazine here. Now I can do that manually by racking the fore end. And you can see that the drum rotates. The way this works is, again, like a Webley Fosbury, on the forward stroke, it moves half a position, and on the rearward stroke, it moves the other half of the position. So there's a peg here that's starting in this position, and it comes forward to here, and then because you're still pulling forward, it forces the drum to rotate to there, and then on the rearward stroke, it comes back like this. Because of the geometry of these points, the drum can't ever rotate backwards. So that's also one of, the, one of the sketchy areas of this specific gun is that these camming grooves had to be very precisely machined in order to work properly. And that's one of the more difficult areas of its design. So let's move on to some disassembly. I mentioned before that this is, what we need to do is consider this to be a tool room prototype, not an actual, not even a field trials level of gun. So, as we go through, you'll see that everything in this gun is basically held together with Allen head screws, which is the sort of thing you would do in a, an early shop prototype, obviously not something that the military would have accepted. So I'm going to start by taking off the rear cover here. So there's our rear cover. It's just sheet metal and a butt pad. Then I can take off the top cover. This just lifts up and out. We have a big metal hook at the front. That connects to this little bar on the top cover. This does also have our sights on it. They are a very simple V-notch and a front blade. And it's you're firing buckshot, it's not, you're not looking for anything particularly precise on a gun like this. All right, next up, let's take off the muzzle brake. This is, uh, we rotate it 90 degrees, and it comes off, and there's a big recoil spring on the front that pushes the barrel backwards. So it turns out the jackhammer is actually a blow forward action, gas operated blow forward really cool and really unusual. So this, this big thing is basically there for show. Um, a few vents maybe hold it down and then you have a surface in the back for the recoil spring to push against. 
then to get the barrel out, I just rotate it. Okay, so the barrel comes out pretty easily. You rotate it 90 degrees and it just pulls out the front of this barrel jacket. Now the way this gun works is, like I said, a blow forward action. You can see we have a gas seal right here. Um, this one's a little bit worn. And then inside the barrel jacket, right about here, you can actually locate it by the, the screws on the outside of the barrel jacket, there is a block inside there. If I shine a flashlight down. You can see that silver ring down in there. The barrel has two gas ports in it, one here, one opposite. So you, one, one drill straight through. And then you have a seal here and you have that block in the back of the barrel jacket. When this is assembled, you have this little short space between this block and that block. When you fire, gas comes through the ports, fills up that area and forces the barrel forward. Now, when we look at the magazine, you'll see that it actually has um, rebated mouths on the chambers, and this, uh, the end of the barrel, actually fits down into the chamber on the drum. When your shot shell fires, the shot shell is sitting more or less right here, and then the end of the shell expands open into the mouth of the barrel, and that forms more or less a gas seal. Then when the, uh, the gas ports do their thing, the barrel goes forward, pulls off the end of the shell, and then the operating rod rotates the drum. This will make more sense when we pull the magazine out. So let's keep disassembling. So the next step in our disassembly, we have to pull off this hook so that we can pull out this pin so that we can take out the magazine. I mentioned this was a tool room prototype. This is not exactly an easy magazine change. Uh, this is actually what you have to do to reload the gun. Uh, obviously not a military effective method given that it requires taking out Allen springs to reload. Uh, the two guns that were sent to HP White for destructive testing actually had a different reloading mechanism. At that, by that point Anderson had perfected a better system and used it for those guns. But again this was the tool room prototype that he kept for himself. So this, this is the center axis pin for the magazine. It is actually brass and been painted black. To clear the magazine out, I now have to run the action forward. There we go. And now I can pull out our 10 round drum. So here we have the back end of the drum with rim slots for the rims of the shells. The front end, you can see that the shells are, are pretty heavily rebated in there. And what happens is this tapered end of the barrel fits into the drum like that. And our shot shell, when it fires, gives us a gas seal because it, it bridges that gap. This is actually, in concept, fairly similar to the Nagant revolvers. Then, when you're firing, um, the gas ports fill with gas, the barrel gets pulled forward, and then the drum rotates one position until the recoil spring on the barrel forces it back into the next open chamber. All right, at this point I want to take a break for a moment and talk about something that is commonly believed uh, and there actually is a lot of truth to it. That is what was called the bear trap. This was, this gun would come with a mechanism by which you could turn this drum into an ad hoc landmine. And so none of the, none of these bear traps were ever actually produced, but there were uh, plastic models of them made again, just like the, the models of the guns made out of wood and clay, there were plastic models of this bear trap mechanism made to test exactly how it would work. And I've talked to some folks who actually uh, saw these things in person, and the plastic models with a, a regular drum ran quite well, apparently. So, so the idea is actually kind of straightforward. You have the drum in, in one part of a fixture, and then you have a second part of a fixture sitting underneath, there was a, a special pressure rim that came up through the, the center axis of the magazine or around the outside. I'm not entirely clear on which. And the, the bottom plate and this top piece uh, had a basically a, a ratcheting sort of T 
teeth mechanism to them so that when you stepped on the top it would compress and then release and you had 10 firing pins on the bottom plate and they would fire all 10 cartridges simultaneously or however many you happen to have loaded at the time. So uh, a very neat, very creative idea, uh, but again, none of them were actually produced that way, so it was never live tried, live fire trialed. All right, getting the rest of the gun apart so that I can show you the firing pin and the actuating rod mechanisms pretty much requires me to take everything else apart. So we will start with these two side plates. These are actually purely decorative to maintain kind of the round profile of the gun. end here is actually held on by a pair of set screws. Got a pair of flats in this operating rod and this fore end is held on by these two screws tightening down on those two flats. Next up I need to take the barrel jacket off. For the moment, I also have to take off the end cap here. This actually holds in the firing pin mechanism, which is kind of interesting as well. So we'll pull this off. That's the end cap that holds the firing pin assembly into the back of the receiver. Here is our firing pin assembly. So the sear is right up here at the top. We'll see how that works in a moment. And then firing pin spring is right inside there and you have two pieces that move back and forth. Take a look at this now. We'll come back to it in a moment. Oh, I have to take the grip assembly off as well. The grip assembly is held on by three screws, two Allen heads up here and a flathead screw that's probably a replacement from some point. All right, now I have pretty much every screw out of this thing. So we can take out the grip assembly. Again, we'll come back to this as well. Okay, we finally got pretty much everything else pulled off of this. I've got the screws out of here. Now, in order to take the shroud off the receiver, and get the operating rod out. I'm going to pull it forward to this point, rotate it up 90 degrees. Now we can separate the receiver from the barrel shroud here, which again, you can see it has that stop right about there for the gas system. And we have our operating rod and half the trigger mechanism here. So in looking at exactly how the firing mechanism works, we're going to start with the trigger frame here. Uh, this is very squared off. Frankly, it's kind of uncomfortable, but a lot of that is because, again, this is a tool room prototype. So the, the final production guns would have had much cleaner lines and a lot less material in these components. Our selector lever works with this little pin. That pin locks into the front of the assembly prevents it from moving when it's in safe. Once I rotate that pin up and out of the way, now I can pull the trigger back. You can see our sear down here. That pushes up when I pull the trigger. And when I put it onto full auto, what the full auto does, you can see there's a cutout in the safety bar here. In full auto, I can't pull it back quite all the way. When I set it to semi, now that cutout allows the trigger to come back just a little bit farther and when it goes all the way back it activates the, the semi-auto disconnector and that's why you hear it snapping. 
when it's in full auto, I simply cannot pull the trigger that far, so it fires until I release the trigger. At any rate, what's happening here is these two arms are getting pushed upward, like so. They are pushing upward into these two bars right here. Then that is coming out here to the front when I push these in. This wedge gets pushed forward. That wedge pushes this spring down and then this whole bolt is under spring tension here because it's locked up against the end of the receiver. So when this goes down and, and falls out of the way, this whole assembly goes forward and inertia pushes the firing pin forward fast enough to detonate a cartridge. That complicated enough for you? It's actually not nearly as complex as it sounds. If I mock this back up with a few other parts in the gun, we can show you exactly how it works. Now, while all of this is going on, this piece is moving back and forth, and this little peg on it is what's actuating the magazine. So this peg is running inside these grooves in the magazine. That's what operates the, uh, the feed mechanism. All right, now I've put some of the pieces back together so I can demonstrate how this actually cycles. So you remember we have our, our op rod assembly here. That is physically linked to the bolt, to the barrel, by this squared off block. You install the barrel through the op rod and then rotate it 90 degrees. So when the barrel moves forward, the op rod goes with it. Now if we look at the magazine, when the op rod goes back and forth, you can see that it operates the drum, forces it to rotate. So when the gun is in the ready to fire position, the sear here is caught in the operating rod, like this. So it's all the way back. When I pull the trigger, that little wedge in the op rod pushes down on the spring-loaded part of the sear. You can see it moving right there. When I pull the trigger all the way, the sear is pushed fully out of the way, which allows the firing pin, spr firing pin spring to push the whole firing pin mechanism forward. It hits a primer, fires the cartridge. Then, because the op rod is directly connected to the barrel, the op rod goes forward. When it goes forward, it rotates the magazine by one position, or rather when it goes forward, it rotates the magazine half a position. When it comes back, it rotates the magazine the other half of a position. The spring-loaded sear catches in the op rod again, and then as the op rod comes the rest of the way back, it tensions the firing pin spring inside here, and the thing is ready to fire again. All right, guys, there's your disassembly and history and operation of the Pancord jackhammer. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I want to throw another shout out to uh, Chad, the owner, for being so kind as to uh, let me get my hands all over this thing. And also the guys at Movie Gun Services. They're the ones who have it right now, um, and they're the ones who offered me the chance to do the video. So definitely couldn't have done it without them. And I also certainly couldn't have done it without all the folks who uh, very generously stepped up and helped uh, provide the financial support to make it possible for me to fly out here and do this. So thank you very much to all of you guys. I appreciate the opportunity and hopefully you guys enjoy the video. Now a couple other things I want to point out before we're completely done here. Uh, we did put this guy on a scale. It comes out at 17 and a half pounds. Again, I, I want to reiterate that this is a tool room prototype and it uses a lot of rather heavy cast parts. The guns that went to HP White uh, for testing and the guns that would have actually been developed and, and sold for commercial and military purposes would have had a lot more plastic. Uh, this upper assembly, for example, is metal on this one. On the HP white guns, that was plastic. Um, the, the trigger assembly frame would have been made out of a much lighter component. Uh, instead of cast, it would have been stamped, most likely. Anyway, the, the HP white guns, where they were able to get them down closer to 10 pounds instead of 17 and a half. Uh, rate of fire on this was about 240 rounds per minute, which is fairly slow. That, that's, you kind of have to have a slow rate of fire to have a 10 round magazine be feasible. Um, as an interesting comparison, 240 rounds a minute is almost exactly what the French Show Show shoots. 
So if you listen to one of those firing, you'll get an idea for what the rate of fire was on this guy. Um, I also want to point out that on the Wikipedia page about the jackhammer, at least as of when I'm filming this, the exploded view they have is directly taken off of one of John Anderson's patents, and it does not quite accurately represent the way this particular gun was made, um, especially the magazine uh, attachment mechanism is different in the patent drawing than it is here, and there are a couple other subtle differences as well. So keep that in mind if you're using that patent drawing as a, a main reference. You should instead use this video as your reference. I hope you guys enjoyed watching the video. Have some uh, a, a basis of reality now when you take a look at a pancor in a video game or a movie. Now, now you actually know how they work. Thanks for watching.